Hello and welcome back to yet another episode of Mind of Steel. This is the weekly delve into the wacky, wonderful world of Britain's most ludicrous conspiracy theorist, Mark Steele. Mark often likes to talk about 5G and other subjects related to radio engineering, which is kind of odd because Mark has no expertise or any kind of knowledge that I can discern related to that subject. He's a former welder, fence installer, nightclub bouncer, and also ex-con. He doesn't have any expertise at all. So where is he getting these ideas from? Well, the obvious answer is because he's a conspiracy theorist, he watches a lot of online conspiracy videos. He's always watching Rumble and Odyssey and Brighteon and Bitshoot, those channels that put out non-stop unedited crap for the undiscerning viewer. But amongst all of these sources of low quality video, there's perhaps one source that has been a greater influence than others to Mark. And I'm talking, of course, of Sabrina Wallace, the prophetess of doom who believes we've all been infected with some kind of biosensor that allows malign forces to read some kind of telemetry from our bodies and maybe even remote controllers. Well, the exact nature of Sabrina's beliefs will be subjects of future shows. But today I want to talk about the papers that Sabrina believes are informing her, or, or rather misinforming her. Do you remember a few weeks ago I did an episode called Sabrina Wallace Can't Read? Uh, in response to that, uh, one excellent viewer suggested that I should talk to Dr. Sholto David. Sholto is a biochemist, but he's also a researcher into the subject of academic integrity. So who better than Sholto to talk to about the subject of entirely bogus fake research, the consequences that it has on the scientific establishment, and how completely bogus research, like the paper that Sabrina cited by Dr. Rahamullah Mir, well, how that kind of paper can cause confusion in the minds of people like Sabrina, who just aren't used to reading scientific papers. So here's my interview with Sholto, and please stick around to the end, because there's a few more important messages for all my fully engaged Mind of Steel viewers. It's this kind of paper, <laughs> First of all, I think it's, it's, it's important to, like, when Sabrina's talking about this, she sees this as an academic paper, a peer-reviewed paper, right? And and I, I guess the, the reason she sees it like that is because it's in the correct format, right? It's, it's got a title, it's got some, uh, some, it's got a journal which it's been placed in, and so when she's seeing this, I assume she thinks it's, it's being peer-reviewed, it's part of the academic literature. Um, when I see something like this, and, and you spoke previously in your last video, you've covered a lot of the, the kind of silliness and the nonsense in this paper, um, there's something else going on. It's it's um, it's what people might refer to as right-only literature. That's literature which is never read. <laughs> um, it's it's been published in what people would describe as a predatory journal, right? So something which isn't really considered a real academic journal by most scientists. Um, and really, you can tell because the the content is nonsense, right? That's okay. It's it's fine to look at a paper and figure out if it is. Uh, silliness, and, and we've discussed some of the research by Rahamullah Mia. Is that that's the first author, isn't it? Mohammed Rahamullah Mia. Scientists, when they are publishing research, right, they need to um, get cited papers to get promotions, right, to prove that they are important and active research. They need their own papers to be cited by other people. That is, someone writes a paper and they reference an existing paper. Right, so there's this existence in science and in scientific careers of metrics where people want to get um, papers cited. So they need to write things. And one of the ways that you can um, boost your metrics is just by publishing a load of rubbish, right? And having other people cite your rubbish um, without it ever really being read by anyone. It just exists to boost metrics, right? So these are just papers which are written. And if you're an author on that paper, you get a credit to say, hey, I've published a paper. Um, and it doesn't really matter if no one reads it, because when you apply for a job, you might say, I've written 10 papers and they've been cited by 10 people. And so these kind of um, efforts where people are publishing uh, junk literature, it's often just to boost their statistics, right? It's that they have a, a statistics saying how many papers they've published and in what journals and how frequently they're cited. So, you know, one of the reasons that people publish silliness and nonsense 
apart from maybe they believe it, but the reason for these journals existing is just to help boost scientific careers, right? So that when, when you've got this long list of authors, it's quite likely that a lot of the people here have never read the paper, right? <laughs> Um, they've been in, approached by perhaps the lead author to say, hey, I'm going to publish this paper. Would you like this to be on your CV? And they'll think, sure, it's a paper which I can claim that I've written. And they don't ever need to read it, right? And they don't expect anyone else will read it. They're just boosting their, their scientific metrics. What does that say, though, about, let's say, the, the scientific ambitions of <laughs> these individuals? Because I, I, I'm sure outside of these very careless seeming institutions that would happily allow their associates to publish this kind of nonsense. If you went to, let's say, uh, Queen Mary University or Imperial College with a paper like this, you're, you're just going to get laughed all the way back to Bangladesh, aren't you? Yeah, and you, you know, a lot of these people are, are not really interested in, in progressing um, outside of uh, their institutions, right? They're simply farming citations to pr to progress and ascend in corrupt institutions in corrupt countries. So Iran is another source of a large amount of nonsense literature, but Iranian scientists exist in a, you know, I don't want to be, be too broad brushed here, but they exist in a corrupt system. And the way that people get academic jobs in corrupt countries is not through, um, you know, mechanisms of, of fairness. What can you tell about this publisher just from the way they're presenting themselves here? Traditionally, scientists used to submit their work to a journal and the journal vets it for quality and then the journal sells access to those articles either through a print subscription right you receive a print of your subscription to nature or science magazine or more recently you access journal articles online and you have to pay a fee to access them right so that's the kind of old model of scientific publishing and it worked okay not brilliantly but then people became upset because all of this research, which is you know genuine research done with public money, is hidden behind a paywall, right? That's not a very good system where scientists go and do work and then they give their work to the journals and journals put it behind a paywall. The solution to this problem is, is open access publishing. And this is where researchers pay a journal a fixed fee that might be, say, $2,000 for a very expensive journal. It could be $10,000. And then the journal hosts the research on their website, the research papers, and people can access it for free. So now you have a system where researchers pay to publish their papers. And that has created intense competition from publishers who have sprung up to publish open access uh, research. So they will email you, they will reach out to you and say, hey, publish research in our journal and you pay us a fee of $2,000, right? So that money doesn't come from the researcher's pocket, it comes from universities. So the, the, the researcher chooses a journal and then the university pays the open access fee. So you can see there's a real kind of incentive for journals to just publish as much as they can. And every time they reject a paper, they don't earn money. So you've got researchers who want to just publish things to boost their metric and you've got journals who want to publish anything to make money. And that creates this system where um, the research is not being peer reviewed properly because every time it's peer reviewed, there's, that's an expense to a journal, but they can just keep all the money if they want, right? So that's this kind of publisher. Um, sci this is what the, the publisher here is scientific and academic publishing, I think it's called, is generally considered to be a predatory publisher. They have very poor record for peer reviewing journal for peer reviewing articles right so they've been included on a list which is somewhat defunct but is well known Beale's list this was compiled by a librarian from the US who's now retired he, he compiled a list of predatory publishers and scientific and academic publishing will be on that list one thing I should add is it doesn't mean that everything that appears in a predatory journal is rubbish but there's a very high chance of it. And, you know, a lot of rubbish goes into to predatory journals. So when you see something in a predatory journal, it's, it's likely that it hasn't been peer reviewed, right? It's likely that it hasn't been properly peer reviewed. So it may or may not be true, but there's no, you, you can't take it as truth um, without having some prior knowledge, right? Because it's quite likely it isn't vetted in the way that most people understand scientific research has been. Let's put ourselves in the... Uh, Sabrina's pointy shoes and, and she asked a question in her podcast which is why should I believe douche canoe over all of these guys? So you want me to believe some rando douche canoe dude rather than all these people? So what's a kind of heuristic or uh, you know, how as a member of the public who maybe isn't aware of 
which are the, the good places to publish and not. This is an ongoing problem, right? This is an ongoing problem in scientific research, and it's, it's somewhat unsolved. When we come to look at research like we're looking at here, though, and, and maybe we'll get to look at more of this later, you know, one good starting place is has it appeared in a non-predatory journal. Um, that's a good starting place. And look at the, the content of the paper, and, and I don't know exactly what was in this paper, but one of the ones that I've looked at from the same author included these kind of bizarre diagrams of a cat on a boat, and he said he's sinking it by GPS. Um, these, <laughs> I think that there has to be an element of, of thinking in, in common sense, right? Thinking, um, looking critically. Oh, here we go. Impact of, <laughs> this is the paper, right? Impact of high radio frequency satellite oscillations. And this is a very long paper and it has very cartoonish like diagrams, right? This is something produced in, in PowerPoint, presumably. Right, here we have the cat on the boat and the applied gravity sensor, right? <laughs> I'm going to read a bit here, it's very funny. The cat's retina was scanned earlier, so the cat quickly moved underwater as the sensor applied gravity. No matter how underwater the cat goes, it can be controlled via satellite-based by satellite voice coding and retina scanning code. I, I mean, it's very hard for me to explain to someone why that is nonsense without just pointing at it. <laughs> Do cats, are you, can you control cats by their retinas? I mean... Can a sensor drag something underwater? Yeah, has, I mean, it, you know, the claim that sensors can affect gravity is remarkable, given that, you know, we've never... I mean, if, that, that would be some Star Trek technology if, if it existed. If, if a paper has made an impossible claim, then for me, that would be a good reason to reject its validity. Now, if you're... If you're someone like Sabrina, who, who is unable to evaluate what is and what isn't an impossible claim, and, and if you zoom in on the diagram as well, like, look at, I, I don't understand what the diagram's supposed to show. It's these fragments of cats on a, this isn't a photograph of an experiment, right? It's, <laughs> it's, it's very poor evidence for the claim. It does, if this, if, if something is, is astonishing, as this is, right, cats being controlled by retinas and sensors and, and, all of this nonsense, then we needed to see very strong documentation of that. And that would be photographs and videos and data and recordings, right? It wouldn't be poorly put together diagrams of cats. I mean, there's no cat underwater there, is there? It's just, it's just pictures. If one of the critical claims of this paper was that they were able to drown a cat using the power of electromagnetic radiation from a sensor, at least you would expect some kind of photo of the cat <laughs> being drowned, rather than this truly bizarre diagram. If you had these kind of ideas about how sensors could warp gravity, I don't think there's any logical reason that you would choose to use them to drown cats, right? At its basis, it's just bizarre, right? If you wanted to demonstrate whatever they're trying to show here, the control of gravity with sensors, there's no real reason for them to put cats on boats to demonstrate that, right? So again, think about the logic of, of what the paper is supposed to show. And um, if it's illogical, which this one is, um, that is a good reason to, to disregard it. And, and if you have very poor reasoning skills, then that might be difficult for you. But I think at some point you, you do have to rely on some sense. Now, you know, if, if the claim is, is very scientific and, and is, is, you know, it's, it's going to be harder to do that. But this isn't really a scientific claim. It, it's it's a, a nonsense diagram with some very odd descriptions. You mentioned a number of other odd features about this paper from Dr. Mohammed Rahimul Amir, uh, such as th there's something fishy about the DOI. Well, what is a DOI and uh, what's wrong with it in this particular case? A DOI is the Digital Object Identifier. So when you publish a paper in a journal, usually they will assign it a Digital Object Identifier and they have to pay a small fee to register that. And when you, you the Digital Object Identifier is the unique code to link back to that paper from, um, from, from a URL from the DOI Foundation. So if you were to copy the DOI, paste it into doi.org slash the unique code, then you always come back to that same paper. So it's a it's a very basic form of indexing. And in many predatory journals will provide a DOI, which doesn't actually resolve, right? So if you 
copy that code into a browser and, and write doi.org slash the Journal of Bioinformatics, it's not found. So what this tells you is they've, they've given a DOI, but it's fake. They've never registered it, and that's probably because they have to pay a very small fee for that. The impression that I got, and I don't know if you've looked at his Twitter, the impression that I have is that these are all genuine things that he believes. So I think that this, re this particular researcher does believe these things, but he's not qualified to write about them, right? His, his, <laughs> his educational history is, is not in biosciences. Um, um, but if you look at his Twitter, he's, he's certainly posting his findings there, and it seems like these are actual uh, beliefs that he holds. But what I imagine that his co-authors, they probably don't read much of this, and it's even possible that he might add the co-authors and they don't even know about it, right? My Twitter aversion is so strong that it didn't even occur to me that I might find him on Twitter. I, I never go to Twitter normally, but oh boy, <laughs> oh boy, I think we've just struck the mother load, because I think based on what I see here, Dr. Rahamul Amir is, he's the Bangladeshi Mark Steele. He, <laughs> he's basically, he, he's saying, what's this, Alexei Navalny, the, the man who was imprisoned in a Siberian gulag. Well, Dr. Amir's insights into, into the, the, the death of the, the um, Russian dissident who he couldn't possibly have known he, he's, he's opining about it. He, he thinks that Navalny was killed by a sensor disease. <laughs> yeah, my research revealed that Alexei Navalny died of asphyxia sensor due to open eyes and fixed GPS location. Yeah, it's fascinating, isn't it? Uh, I kind of feel like Putin had an easier way to do away with him than, than opening his eyes and fixing his GPS location, but... <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, you know, my impression when I when I look at, at this particular guy is that he, is that he probably believes the stuff. Um, and if, if you look at his educational history, he has an ORCID account. Um, he doesn't really have any qualifications relevant to or any serious qualifications, right? If you look at his ORCID account, you'll see he lists his qualifications. They seem quite scattered. And, and he's claimed to have an, like an academic leadership role in the university where he works. I don't know if that's true. He has listed an academic email from that actual university. So it seems he probably works there or has studied there. But whether or not he's um, truly has a leadership role, it's much harder to tell. His background is not in medicine or, or sensor technology. He's an, apparently an environmental scientist. Yeah, I mean, the, the unusual things, um, first of all, right, his, his, his qualifications, when we, when we looked at those qualifications, they're kind of all over the place, right? He has like four or five supposed master's degrees in different subjects. His PhD is in, environment, is in environmental management. But when you look at what he's publishing, that's not really in, in environmental management, right? It's about sensors and it's about virology, right? So, and his list of publications is, again, pretty all over the place. Um, and with pretty bizarre titles, Man-Made Earthquake, right? So that's his first publication there. Um, and as, as we discussed before, he's got this uh, strange m medal that he's apparently won. This doesn't read like a typical scientist's ORCID profile. Um, normally, you'll progress from your bachelor's to do your master's and then your PhD, and then you'll start publishing yeah. in that area, right? Rather than um, doing apparently two different, three different bachelors he's got listed there, um, and then one, two, three, four, five masters, and then a PhD, right? Even the amount of time that you'd need to do that doesn't really make sense here. Um, 105 publications, is that a large amount? No, I don't, I don't think it's a large amount of publications for someone later in their career. If you publish, say, 10 papers a year for 10 years, that would be, you know, easy way to reach 100. So that's not particularly unusual. Um, <laughs> um, but certainly the type of publications he has are unusual. He has a, a, an absolutely bizarre biography here, I, um, in addition to this medal. <laughs> but let, he is the person who has discovered coronavirus from his Ishna effect published at some URL. He created a model on pederast. Pe pederast? Surely he... That's not the sort of thing any native English speaker would, would name their paper, but he means pan, pandemic disease recovery through advanced, advanced sensor technology. Now, if that had been written by Chris Morris or, or some kind of prankster, we'd, we'd all be saying that that was a, a hilarious joke, wouldn't we? Um, he detects the yeah. root cause of global, global climate crisis 
published at some other URL. He has 105 publications at national and international indexed journals. Yeah, I mean, and, and the, you know, the way that he's written and, and listed these URLs, it's, it's not a normal scientific way of writing, right? Normally you would say which journal you published your research in, <laughs> rather than just giving the URL, and that's probably because the journals aren't very impressive, and, and because he's a poor writer, right? He's not very good at writing or communicating, and you can see that on his um, on his ORCID and, and everywhere, on everything he's written, his, even his Twitter is a mess. Right? People, when they yeah. read some of his papers, the, the comments were all I bet this was written by an artificial intelligence. But if you actually try and get an artificial intelligence to write a paper for you, it, it comes out, it might be nonsensical at, at its higher levels of meaning, but AIs have quite good grammar these days. This is, this is something altogether different. This is, this is um, like it was maybe written by a child or perhaps even Mark Steele. When, when we look at these really bold, bizarre claims, something that we'd need to see here is either them be really well documented, and if they're not, perhaps they need to be replicated, right? They need another more credible scientist to come along and say, hey, this guy's a bit of a maverick, but I'm gonna go and look at this and try and replicate it. But when we see <laughs> these are just his own bizarre claims in journals that have never been backed up by any reasonable experiments, right? This is a good reason to dismiss him. And it's it's hard to draw that bright line between you know, what is science and, and what is silliness because th there is you know some kind of middle ground unfortunately there really isn't a shortcut right if there was a shortcut between telling information from misinformation then life would be a lot easier there is no shortcut here you have to look at different aspects and 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 then make an informed decision right so just looking at the paper and saying hey this looks like a scientific paper therefore it's being peer-reviewed is a very immature approach looking at him more broadly in the system he exists in and his history this is a, a better way to look at it and it, it's pretty clear that this is not a research we should trust when he talks about things that he's not qualified to talk about, things that aren't backed up by any logic or any <laughs> replications. This kind of thing can be dismissed, right? And see, when, when I talked earlier about the kind of citations that people are trying to build, this is what people are doing. They're trying to boost their citations. On the right hand, you've got a, a chart, right? And that chart shows how many times his papers have been cited each year in Google Scholar. So this is the kind of statistics that he's trying to build up, and this is what people will look at as a kind of shortcut to see how productive someone is as a researcher. So even though all of his research is, is nonsensical, it goes into these crap journals, no one really probably reads it, he's still able to build what looks like a kind of credible profile here, right? He's got every year, he's got more and more citations, he's got a list of, of papers which appear on, on Google Scholar, but when you start picking this apart more carefully, you'll see that this isn't, <laughs> the papers which cite his papers probably don't do it in any reasonable way, right? They're not going to be building on the logic of his claims, there'll be self-citations or there'll be just irrelevant citations. It seems to be the latter, doesn't it? Because if we look at the people who cited his COVID paper, We've got this one, sociology. This one is a resource management. Yeah. Uh, something about heat waves. Yeah. And they're environmental science. And they're all all papers which he's written. They're all papers which he's written as well, right? So. So he's created some kind of self-citing clique of papers. This is a problem very broadly in science, right? It happens at the top, and it happens all the way down. Where if if you're measured on your productivity by how often people cite your papers, then one easy way to game that is just cite yourself more often. And this is an extreme example because it seems like all of these have been, uh, all of his citations are, are self citations. So here's one, um, even in his, which presumably it, forest biodiversity is closer to his PhD subject, if indeed it's a real PhD. But, but isn't this bizarre? Look, look if we scroll yes. down into the, uh, <laughs> It's the same nonsense. It's it's the he's saying that the 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 loss of biodiversity in Bangladesh's forests is caused by the misuse of wireless sensor technology. Yeah, I love this line. This is a great line. Studies show that encroachment by forest criminals is the main cause of deforestation and depletion of forest in a particular GPS. Forest criminals. These are <laughs> it's a great word. <laughs> I some, some yeah, kind of um, I can imagine some kind of like naughty beaver character from from an episode of Yogi Bear. I look at a lot of poor quality research, right? And I write a lot about poor quality research. And this is at the extreme end, right? This is at the the very very poor quality of 
badly written, irrelevant nonsense claims. You know, this is this is. I've enjoyed reading through a few of these, and and I tried to contact a couple of the journals. I, I sent some emails to see if they would look at retracting some of these papers, but you know. These aren't real journals. They have lists of people who are the editors, but they're not going to respond to emails. And so they didn't reply. But this is, you know, if we look at the broad spectrum of research, there are some people who may publish one or two papers like this or be an author on one or two papers. And then most of their content is uh, a bit more towards the sensible size. But this is someone who just almost exclusively publishes um, nonsense and rubbish. And is, it's, it's quite an extreme example. And it's very entertaining as well. Thank you so much for watching this video through to the end. Uh, while you're here, please give it a like and a subscribe because that helps the YouTube engines propel me to even loftier heights. Who would have believed that a channel about Mark Steele could have over 20,000 subscribers? It seems completely nuts. When I first started this, I thought I'd be lucky to get 500. After all, how many people would really want to hear about Britain's most ludicrous conspiracy theorist, and of course, America's most ludicrous prophetess of doom. And now we have Bangladesh's most ludicrous conspiracy theorist, the only man who might give Mark Steele a run for his money. It, it's truly ludicrous, and that's why we are all hooked on watching all three of these crazy wackaloons. Now, before I go, just a little update. Uh, following my last Sabrina episode, Sabrina Wallace Can't Read, she responded with a 40-minute rant that is so bizarrely spectacular, it will have to be the subject of a future episode. I just don't have time to respond to all of the zany things she says. But uh, in her Telegram chat room, one of her ardent viewers did also respond to uh, my critique of Dr. Rahamullah Mir's cat experiment. And uh, here's what Heather Carr said. If you read the article, it sounds like the experiment is a cat in a container in a boat because it then says the retinal sensors are still accessible, which means the cat's eyes are open, and then compares it to the retinal sensors for people in submarines. I think some context is lost in translation, but that's my interpretation. Not drowning cats, but putting them underwater in a container. Of course, this is also horrible for the cat to experience, but if they were drowning, how would the retinal sensors be available? I would like to know more about his methodology for his experiments. Maybe we can contact the guy to get more data on his research. Well, Heather, your perspective on Dr. Rahamun Amir's research is very desired, and I do hope that you manage to get in contact with Dr. Mir himself, and maybe he will explain his methodology. I, for one, am absolutely curious to know what on earth was the point of attempt seemingly drowning or not drowning the cat in the boat in the university lake. And on that uh, strange, surreal, cat-infused note, I bid you all adieu for another week, and I shall see you for another episode of Mind of Steel as soon as one is ready.